it's Monday, and that so happens to be the day that I like to talk about monsters. I am Jeff Arbuckle, and this is Monster Mondays, presented to you by Film Seizure. The green slime are coming. Yes, this week I'm looking at the 1968 Japanese sci-fi film, The Green Slime. Now, this is an interesting film that comes together from a couple of different angles. Um... It was originally meant to be part of an Italian series of sci-fi movies that were being made at the time, but that kind of fell through. So instead, it was made in Japan with a Japanese director, Kenji Fukasaku, and an entire crew of Japanese filmmakers. But it was produced by Walter Manley and Ivan Reiner, who were both Americans. But they really only produced movies throughout the 60s, not much before and pretty much nothing afterwards. Uh, However, Fukasaku made almost 70 films in his lifetime. Now, another uh, this is another one of the films written by Bill Finger, who was one of the creators of Batman. I had previously discussed uh, Track of the Moon Beast just last month that he also did. Another writer for this film, Tom Rowe, has a fascinating couple of credits. He was uh, the uh, screenwriter for the Tarzan movie that was directed by John Derrick that managed to somehow fixate more on John's wife, Bo Derrick, more than the titular character. I guess John John Derrick did that a lot. Um, he was kind of a weirdo about that. But, uh, he, uh, but uh, Rowe... Um, was also the guy who was credited for the story of Disney's Aristocats. So that's kind of a weird couple of credits there. Charles Sinclair, who was uh, the third writer on this, um, was really just more of a writing partner of Bill Fingers, uh, having also done Track of the Moon Beast and the episodes of Batman and 77 Sunset Strip that uh, Finger has on his credits. Uh, But as for the actors, first up we have Robert Horton, who was a pretty steady television actor up until the late 80s. Uh, But The Green Slime was one of only two film credits that he had after 1954. Uh, Pretty much mostly what he did uh, for most of his career was a lot of TV work. Richard Jekyll is also in this and had a significant TV career as well, uh, but wasn't a stranger to some noteworthy movies like John Carpenter's Starman and Chosen Survivors, which is a really fascinating movie that I should consider uh, for this show at some point because it's um, it, it's a kind of an end of world story, but there's also these bats in it that play a part in it. It's it's a very strange uh, sci-fi. Uh, almost dystopian kind of movie but um, it's been a while since I've seen it but I've considered doing it uh, for the show but the most recognizable actor in this at least to me is Luciana Paluzzi now by name uh, most wouldn't likely recognize her despite having a pretty solid 25 year career in movies and TV shows both in Italy and in Europe but also in the United States. Uh, Probably, though, she's best recognized by face as the red-headed femme fatale assassin and specter goon in 1965's Thunderball. Now, Thunderball isn't just one of my favorite Bond films, but it is, uh, if you adjust for inflation in the United States, the highest grossing Bond film in history. So that's not a bad movie to be in for her. Now, the movie opens on Space Station Gamma 3, who is reporting back to Cape Canaveral, uh, basically doing mundane, like, weather reports and stuff like that. Uh, But suddenly, uh, their transmission gets interrupted by interference, and it's caused by a giant asteroid on a collision course with Earth. Then, all of a sudden, (laughs) out of nowhere, there's this really rocking theme song for the movie. It is an utterly bonkers rock and roll song that uh, has no place in this movie, but is also very awesome all the same. Now, NASA realizes that the asteroid called Flora has been dislodged from its normal orbit in the asteroid belt. Now, uh, there's some consideration whether or not this was actually based on the real life uh, asteroid that's in the Flora belt of the asteroid belt that's called uh, Flora 8. Uh, I believe it gets that name because it's the eighth distinct asteroid that's that was observed within the Flora ring. Um, it's kind of like if we look at 
a, a star, we name the star and then we say whatever the name of the star is, dash one for the first planet that we find or whatever. Uh, but I, but there's a lot of thought that maybe that this was using that real asteroid, uh, Flora 8, as the uh, basis of this of this movie but anyway they send a group of astronauts led by commander jack rankin who is robert horton to blow up the asteroid now uh, commander vince elliott played by uh, jekyll is a good friend of jack's and he's uh, been overlooked to lead the mission he's the commander of gamma 3 and there's this whole backstory that we'll be talking a little bit more about here in just a moment but um, it does also ruffle the f- uh, feathers of the sexy Dr. Lisa Benson, who's Paluzzi. Um, and that is because she was at one point in time Jack's lover and is now Vince's fiance. Um, so that's kind of part of that backstory. I'll be getting into a lot more of that here in just a moment. But uh, Vince, uh, <laughs> uh, no pun intended, convinces jack to bring him along and just like that the crew blasts off from uh, gamma 3 to go blow up flora Uh, the crew starts digging into the rock to put the explosives in there so that it can help break up the asteroid Uh, but while doing that a scientist that was commissioned to go with them from gamma 3 is uh, going out and looking for samples and notices an interesting and some uh, and somewhat sentient green goo on this rock, and, but the goo gets all it gets over everything, including the rover that was used to position the uh, crew uh, to uh, basically start digging in and, and planting the uh, the explosives and whatnot, which causes the vehicle to not start. They are then radioed frantically to move the detonation up. Uh, to basically 20 minutes from now because the uh, rock is accelerating toward Earth. Rankin, realizing that they may not be able to outrun the blast, kind of has no choice but to comply. And that's a major factor in some of the, uh, and particularly Jack and Vince's characters. Uh, Jack had uh, written Vince up on a report. Um, I can't remember if it's actually said that he did this after Uh, Lisa dumped him and started going out with Vince or what but he says that uh, you know Vince is too nice of a guy to basically uh, be able to lead men and make tough decisions whereas Jack is very cold and regimented about his uh, about accepting orders and giving orders Um, he's almost uh, too quick to sacrifice his crew um, and, and to make that decision to sacrifice his crew, whereas Vince is trying to keep as many people alive as possible. Um, now, the scientist that found the slime originally wanted to bring back a sample uh, because he you know, recognizes it as a living thing, but Rankin is just pissed off about it. He just smashes the container against the ground. And it's like, no, you're not bringing that back. You know, chews his ass how to, uh, to get him onto the ship. Um, so, uh, the team barely gets away before the asteroid explodes and barely is able to escape the, uh, the impact, uh, or the force of the explosion. Um, but they didn't realize that a tiny bit of the green goo, uh, got, uh, onto one of the crew members spacesuit and is coming back to Gamma 3. Now, the heroes return to the station to a raucous crowd cheering them on, but Rankin is pissed about uh, the the behavior, particularly of the scientist on the rock and wanting to bring back the green goo, and the total disregard for their orders, which uh, forces him to make the decision to have the team run through extra decontamination protocols. And at this point, we get a little bit more of the love triangle angle. And we learn that, uh, you know, like I said, Jack and Lisa were together, but she dumped him to be with his best friend, Jack, and or to uh, be with his best friend, Vince. And she and Vince got engaged. Um, And while we're learning about this, the green goo gets out in the lab and it's uh, and it leads to a crew member being electrocuted by it. But as the people on the space station check out the strange goings on on uh, Gamma 3, we soon see that the goo has mutated into a one eyed tentacled monster. 
because of course it does and that's what makes this movie so damn charming um but the this leads to the guys on gamma 3 kind of chasing this little monster dude around because it starts off as kind of like a little little kid-sized uh, monster and it gets bigger and bigger but uh, the doctor who was originally interested in the green slime collects some of the green goo blood and figures out that the cells duplicate and grow unlike anything they had ever seen in science he also figures out that the goo grows exponentially when uh, it's given an electric charge um, so that means that the power room is going to be where the green slime creature will want to go to grow and reproduce as quickly as possible and kind of feed off of the station's energy. And sure enough, uh, the creature is growing larger and larger. But it also means that they can't use their own weapons against the monsters because two things, it will feed on the energy and use it against them, but also that if it bleeds, the blood will then create a duplicate monster it's going to reproduce that way um, they ultimately figure out how they might be able to corral the creatures using uh, flashlights to lure them to places where they can be locked away in various rooms on the station and then they try to block off a particular block of the station and trap them between the airlocks uh, but the scientist guy refuses to leave until he gets all of his paperwork and studies which of course causes Vince to refuse to leave the guy to die so he opens up the airlock to find that the guy's dead anyway and they nearly mess up their plan but at least they are able to make it work so that they can blow up that block of Gamma 3. Now Jack radios back uh, to uh, basically get the whole place evacuated by uh, people from Earth uh, so that they can also, um, he also asks permission, I should say, to blow up Gamma 3, which, uh, you know, is, to, is made to prevent the green slime creatures from getting everywhere and getting anywhere, particularly on Earth, uh, but that ultimately pisses off Vince. However, the evacuation is uh, complicated by the slime creatures being outside the escape hatch for the ships to get everyone evacuated. Uh, and trying to kind of prove himself worthy, Vince leads the team to get rid of the creatures on the outside, which does manage to help get uh, the evacuated people off the station. Now, due to an issue with the rescue from the command center, Jack has to have a big time action scene to correct some stuff in the station to finish the job so that uh, the people from Earth can basically pilot the space station into the atmosphere. Uh, Vince ends up going to help him, which helps uh, Jack, but gets Vince killed. The station is uh, blown up in the end and the creatures are burned up in the atmosphere. So let's get to my three things that I like about this little monster movie for my first pick i gotta say i was surprised how very japanese but also how very american this movie is uh, there's a really interesting blend at play here uh, the characters their bravado the general plot is very american however the sets uh, the use of miniatures looks like one of the uh, japanese kaiju films that took place on another planet or out in space um there's a, a take on the astrophysics and the science to all of this that also kind of comes off as more Japanese. It, it seems more Japanese in design and in the way that they figure things out. Uh, I love how the crew's ship uh, launches from the space station to intercept the asteroid. It's essentially dollied uh, to the edge of the ship's cargo door and then it's just kind of let go to float out. And once at a safe distance, it then ignites its boosters and away they go. Uh, it's, it seems very practical in that way. And I think uh, most of us usually think of this sort of launch being done straight away with rockets and thrusters, thrusters and such. But this actually makes a little bit more sense. Uh, maybe it's not as exciting, but it makes sense to not use up and burn up a lot of fuel plus um launching inside a <laughs> inside a space station with thrusters and boosters and stuff uh, does not seem practical at all now second uh while it is also kind of out of place in a science fiction monster movie the drama between vince jack and lisa is as interesting as it is unexpected um you'd think that there'd be no need for this at all in this movie 
In some ways, it does show how simplistic the movie's story is that they had to place this subplot into the movie. Uh, it adds fascinating dialogue in the movie. For example, Lisa asks Jack why he had to turn in Vince for breaking some rules to prevent a member of his uh, command from being killed. Um, this leads to Jack coming off as a hard ass by saying he would have sacrificed someone no problem. And he also says that Vince should be able to accept the dressing down and, quote, not bitch about it all over the place, unquote. It's such a weird line for 1968. And while Vince is considered uh, a nice guy and maybe too nice of one to really be in charge of men, uh, we also learn that Jack is a bit of a jerk ass and Lisa is mostly seen dealing with how much she doesn't like Jack. It's such a bizarre triangle of people who are deemed too weak to lead guys, too regimented to not really have much compassion and a doctor utterly frustrated with the situation of the two guys uh it's just such a weird way to frame your movie with these lead characters but third i really do love little one-eyed tentacle guys um he seems to have like sparklers at the end of his tentacles that shocks people whenever they uh uh you know they take in the energy that's uh, being given to him or that they're siphoning off from the uh, electrical stuff that it lights up their tentacles so that they can shock people with it but he's just barreling through people and forcing them into open high voltage structures um, it, it, they're dangerous you know but it's also kind of cute how uh, the first one that we see just kind of flails about and waddles around and away from people but it absorbs and uses energy as both a life uh, substance uh, but uh, and a form of attack really um, when it bleeds it is able to reproduce as the blood cells will grow and form into a new creature uh, it um, makes the creatures difficult to kill or destroy when you can't use energy weapons against them and in fact if you think about it any kind of weapon would create kinetic en energy so it's very possible they would be completely and totally unable to be destroyed or attacked um, but it's you know and then on top of that if you make them bleed while well, you've just created another monster also that's not to mention that the creatures they discover can heal themselves as well so it turns out that they're a little bit of doctor who and a little bit of japanese monster all rolled into one and that makes them fun and and it adds a little tension to the movie too for the heroes so that wraps up this week's monster mondays don't forget to check out new episodes of film seizure every wednesday and a new installment of monster mondays each monday on filmseizure.com as well as places where fine podcasts are found like soundcloud apple Podcasts, google Podcasts, stitcher tune in amazon and spotify additionally hop on over to facebook and twitter to follow us by just searching for film seizure and you know while you're at it head over to uh, www.bmovieenema.com that's my website and read a new text article each and every friday and if you want to watch a movie there's now an episodic b movie enema series found on youtube new episodes will be coming out every saturday from january 2nd to march 27th 2021 so come watch a full movie with me on youtube by searching for b movie enema or on the b movie enema website so, until next week, stay spooky.